Hello, you're listening to the Streaming Audio Podcast, and on today's episode we have an old friend and colleague of mine, Ben Ford. Ben's a programmer, but he's also something of a systems design thinker. And during this chat, we've managed to bounce around a lot of different topics, drawing parallels between event systems design and military organization, agile, uh, both the good and the bad kinds of agile, psychology, how we interpret the world, music composition. It's, it's a real smorgasbord, this episode, and it all ties back to our world of event streaming. Uh, I'm really glad we got Ben on the show at last because I always love talking to him. He's always interesting to me. I hope it'll be interesting to you. Before we get started, let me tell you that Streaming Audio is brought to you by Confluent Developer, which is our site that's jam-packed with information on how to build successful systems with event streaming and Apache Kafka. Whether you want to get started or dive deeply into the internals of how Kafka works, there's information there to help you. And when you need to get Kafka up and running, take a look at our cloud service, confluent.cloud. You can get a free account and a Kafka cluster up and running in minutes, and it will scale all the way up to ludicrous sizes. And once you've got an account, add the promo code PODCAST100 on the billing page, and you'll get $100 of extra free credit. And with that, I think it's time for Ben Ford to tell us how he got started as a programmer. My guest today is Ben Ford. Ben, welcome to Streaming Audio. Thanks, Chris. I've been really looking forward to this one. It's good to have you. We haven't spoken in far too long because we used to work together, right? Yeah, twice, actually. It's been, uh, it has been ages, hasn't it? Apart from it, the odd sort of uh, WhatsApp, it's been, yeah, God, it's uh, been... an uncomfortably large amount of years. <laughs> yeah, but we met even longer ago than before all that. And to, to frame this, where we're going, right, let's, let's start here. I learned programming, reading a book on how to program in my bedroom, which in a way is similar to you, in a way really isn't. Tell people how <laughs> you got started with programming. So back in 2003, uh, I was serving the Royal Marines um, on my way to uh, the invasion of Iraq uh, called Optelic, and I was rather bored on, on, board a, on board a ship called HMS Ocean. So I had two books delivered. One was on Linux, one was on Python, and I basically sat below decks all the way through, you know, the Med and down past Saudi Arabia and banged my head against my laptop until I figured out the basics of <laughs> Python. <laughs> Banging your head against the keyboard as a, as a way of relaxing from the day to day. Pretty much. I mean, it's, uh, I don't think my programming journey's ever really been any different than banging my head against the keyboard. And I guess it's the same <laughs> yeah. for everyone else, right? <laughs> it's a very familiar experience. At least, at least most people have internet to go and like check what, what the problem was. And I didn't, I just had the book. So I literally oh, had no option other than banging my head. <laughs> yeah, there's not much support slightly underwater in the Mediterranean, is there? Not really, no. <laughs> cool. So how long did you spend between there and actually becoming a professional programmer? So that was 2003. Um, I left the Marines in 2004. Um, and I just, you know, I, I, I knew the basics of programming, but not enough to be a professional software engineer by any means. So I just worked little bits of scripting into different jobs. Um, I found myself in New Zealand working for a, um, a telecoms company and I was one of the field engineers and we had no maps of how to get to anything. So I, uh, I taught myself a little bit of Django and built a little web app for the field engineers to find their way around. And then I did it, you know, a couple of other odds and ends. And by the time I moved back to the UK in 2008, I was you know, good enough for somebody to take a punt on, uh, on, <laughs> on me as a, as a full-time engineer. Is that how you got into the banking world? So that, that was interesting, actually. So I definitely wasn't qualified for banking either. Um, <laughs> so I, after a year or two of working for that company up in Oxford, um, I wanted to get into, into finance and to get into the city. And one of the things I'd done with Django was basically pull it apart and figure out how to make it work with multiple databases way back when I was doing this telecom stuff. Mm. And there was a hedge fund in London that had, you know, they, they'd chosen Django to replace an internal tool and they needed it to talk with multiple databases and it didn't do that at the moment. So there was a, oh. a bit of direct experience that kind of made up for the lack of any kind of math skill. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, so, so I kind of blagged my way into that. And then, you know, once you've got your first 
sort of foot in the door in, in the finance world, especially with a, a big name like that, it's, uh, you know, the rest of them become a lot easier. Yeah, yeah. And I, I don't know about programming for a bank. Sure, you need some maths, but the ability to wrangle the impossible seems far more about the day to day, right? Well, yeah, I mean, we can we can certainly get on to, you know, technical problems not turning out to be technical at all. I'm sure that's what we'll end up spending most of our time talking about. <laughs> yeah. So from banking, at some point, I know you got into things like functional programming and event streaming. Tell me how that came up. So after that first hedge fund, um, that was an algorithmic hedge fund. Um, so I went to work, I had a short stint at an investment bank, and then I went to work for a startup hedge fund, which was you know, also an algorithmic hedge fund, but very, very purist in, in how they thought of you know, trading signals and things. And along, along the way, somehow, my, you know, I'd, I'd started being maybe less satisfied with the object-oriented way of programming and just becoming more and more functional. You know, Python has the basics of, of functional programming built in. Hmm. And as that kind of style had developed, I'd, you know, got some advice from people Look, you know, there's a whole seam of stuff here that, you know, Python is a very thin slice of what functional programming actually is. And if you want to, to learn it properly, you should, you should look at Haskell. So I did, you know, completely alien, weird syntax, but quite yeah. captivating because I'd already been kind of, you know, sipping the Kool-Aid a little bit. <laughs> so yeah. I wasn't allowed to use Haskell at my hedge fund, but I, I was sort of teaching myself it out out of um, out of work hours, and I did I did a little play around with some time series analysis, hmm. and you know the the kind of mind blowing moment was you know having very little experience in this language, wanting to read some stuff from a database, display it as a time series, you know banging my head against it for ages, probably you know two days on and off just you know figuring out how all the types work together and then finally get it to compile and you know this is my first experience in a compiled language and you know obviously from python background yeah. you're expecting now okay now i just need to work through a you know long list of bugs and make it actually do the thing i want it to do and when i ran it it did the thing i wanted it to do immediately because i'd made the types line up and it was just like <laughs> so that was it you know i was sold from that point <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I, I think that's one of the things that's always appealed to me about Haskell. It's like you get all your pain up front, but at yeah. least you know you deal with it early, and it, you don't deal with it so much later, right? Yeah, and it's very principal pain. You know, you only get pain when you don't adhere to the principles that that you know the laws of nature and mathematics tell you you have to adhere to. So it's kind of like pain <laughs> in a way. Yeah, it sort of forces you to think in a particular way, but once you get there, you start agreeing with it. Yeah, I don't or, know. or we both completely indoctrinated one of the two. Yeah, yeah, it's it's either doing things the right way or it induces Stockholm syndrome. <laughs> <laughs> or both. <laughs> but you've had you've had those couple of years half underwater banging your head against the keyboard so you're you're ripe for learning Haskell, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I was yeah. Uh, conditioned almost. <laughs> yeah. So that takes us to kind of about the time you met, right? Uh, sorry, yeah. you 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 and I met. Yeah. Because well, I remember first meeting you at a company called Finder. I think we're allowed mm -hmm. to mention the name. That's right. And I'd been doing a lot of functional programming in those years. But this was the first time I'd seen event systems. So yep. tell us how you got into doing that and why you did it that way. So so Finder was a, um, you know, it had a grand, a grand vision of being like a, you know, an Uber for time slots, right? So, it, you know, Rich executive moves moves to a different city, wants to do a Pilates class or something, and you know has an app that they can go and find it all. Hence the name, and um, and you know one of the things that I'd learned in this in the process of building this algorithmic trading system is if you if you separate things into the things that have concretely happened, and I you know you touched on this in one of your earlier episodes, which I really enjoyed, and the thing that you said there was don't store the conclusions, store the facts. Mm. And, you know, functional programming makes you very much think of, you know, immutable facts and, you know, it's a fold in, in, our, in our language, right? So I'd already been thinking along these lines. And then when, when the founder of, founder of Finder, sounds a bit weird, but the, <laughs> when the founder of Finder explained the vision, I was like, well, you know, you really want to think about this, you know, that the architecture that you need for this is, is 
to do it this way so that you can you know ask the questions that you don't know later on and you know you can much more appreciate the properties of the system and you know i think if i was to build you a, a team of haskell engineers that we would find really incredible people and it would make you know it's the right tool for the job and you know if you remember the, the team that we had there that was absolutely the case you know haskell is a you know, massive ta talent magnet it still is now but you know back then it was even more the case right yeah you could get the top of the line haskell programmers who would work at a discount just to yeah. be able to use it as their day job right exactly yeah um yeah, looking back on that gig, I should have asked for slightly more money. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we, we got into that thing of just record the facts and then fold or in, in Kafka language do a, a transformation on that stream of events and gradually build up the picture you actually need to run the business. Yeah. And it yeah. was actually, you are, you probably you're the starting part of the causal chain that leads me to be working for Confluent these days. Cause that was the first time I'd like seen event yeah. systems. Yeah. Yeah. You've, you set in, uh, in motion the first domino. Yeah. Well, so what was really, really interesting about that was that, you know, we had that in the back end, And if you remember, you know, you took over from a guy that had built a front end in angular. Yeah. And this was angular one, right? Uh, I can't remember. I'm it sure just... it was, it was the, it was yeah. the version of angular that they gave up on. Right. And, but I think the, the more important thing than the technology was just the difference in understanding of the possibilities of that architecture. Cause you know, mm. I remember talking to you, you know, when we first met literally the, the, you know, interview and you know, the moment I thought this is going to work is when you were like, Oh, that's a really interesting architecture. And then I knew that you would <laughs> want to kind of take that into the front end as well. And we ended up with obviously, you know, a completely real time, well, not, not hard real time, but you know, a real time front end where the state of the world was always consistent, no matter what device you were looking at. And that was all a function of picking the right abstraction, really. Yeah. Yeah. It was the first time I'd seen an architecture like that it was like, we send facts in, they get transformed, they get streamed out in real time over web sockets into the fr into various front ends. I've actually written a blog post about this, like reflecting. Yeah, I read it. Yeah, it's great. Oh, yeah. We'll put a link in the show notes. Um, but it was the first time I'd seen the potential of that kind of live system. Because uh, we talk about a lot on this show about the difference between soft real time and batch processing. Mm. But looking back, this is the first time I'd seen a website that wasn't batch processing. Yeah, it was a it was a living reacting to facts event system. Yeah. And I mean, the nice thing about building things in an event system is that you can always batch because these things have very well understood semantics about composition. So you can always go from an event, an event driven system to a batch system because you just, you know, chunk up your inputs and, you know, run you know this yeah, it's a one line one line of code once you've got the underlying event system written but trying to go the other way from a batch system or from a world where you've thrown away facts and stored conclusions yeah you know you've you've lost the ability to to do that backwards transformation yeah yeah and i i know a lot of stuff we do internally at confluent is about trying to gradually you can't you can't bolt on real time onto a batch system and you don't want to do a big bang rewrite so a lot of the work we do ends up being finding ways to gradually bring in a real time system to an existing batch system and make them work in harmony right which is so i don't know if you remember the the bit of work we did at finder to extract once we once we got the system built we wrote a, a thing to extract data from an old system and transform oh, that into yeah. an event stream that would be applied to the new system. Do you remember that? Yeah, I do. I do. We, we so that were, was we another really interesting. The old. Yeah, that was another really interesting property of having those clearly defined semantics in the new system is that you could then write a script that turned the old system into an event stream from the data that you had. So you know, think a database that had timestamps of stuff, and you could catch all of the logic errors that you had in the old system, like you know, an instructor that was booked into uh, that was instructing two classes at the same time. Yeah. So you could, you know, you could basically find out where things didn't cleanly apply. But that was that was super interesting as well, because, you know, we were able to use the 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 core semantics almost as like a really rough and dirty scripting 
thing around the outside that quality didn't really matter because the data, you know, the quality of the code didn't matter so much because the quality of the data was never in doubt because it had to pass all of these constraints before it was allowed to write into the new system. Yeah. Yeah. Um, once we captured those facts, you could always reconstruct the state you were looking for experimentally until you got it right. right? Yes. It was Yeah. It was a very interesting system. In a way, I think it was, it's tempting to say it was ahead of its time, but looking at the same time, you've got um, Kafka being built because this is around 2014, right? Yep. Unbeknownst yep. to us over at LinkedIn, they were building Kafka, spinning out to Confluent. Um, so actually, I think I think Kafka was there was an early version of it um, available. The reason the reason that we ended up um, going with Postgres was because we we used the constraints in Postgres as part of the the checks when you want to apply the the facts. Mm. So if you remember, we had we had commands that would be come in via one channel. Mm. Those commands would generate a series of events based off what the current state of the world was. So, you know, I want to book a class, but I don't have enough credits means that you would get a certain event stream. If I do have enough credits, I would get a different event stream, which included a, a class booking. Mm. Um, and we used the constraints in, in a, in a do normalized Postgres schema as part of the semantics of whether the events could be applied. Um, and then obviously we also had for the for the WebSocket side of things, we had the ability to subscribe to Postgres um, events. So it wasn't, I don't think, you know, if you look at what's available in today's world, I don't think you would consider that a full kind of streaming system. Event sourcing, yes, but uh, you, you would certainly Event sourcing it. on top of relational, right? Yeah. 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 And, you know, we could fold the events into anything else. Like I think I... I do. I folded it into. Uh, I folded it into a couple of systems. I think just to do analytics. Um, but it's it's less of a you know the the event stream was the database, whereas I think you would probably you would probably consider that slightly different than building a you know Kafka from the ground up system. From what I understand of of Kafka. Mm. Yeah, I think I've always thought it would be interesting to rewrite that system with today's technology and see how it played out. Um, maybe somehow I'll get to do a prototype of that one day. But, but yeah, moving that be, on, that would be cool. Yeah, it would. It, there's a there's a lot more support for building that kind of system today. Yeah. But moving on from that, right? So then Finder, for reasons I don't think that were technological, Finder didn't work out, um, and that's a story for another day. But you then moved on into some more banking gigs. I know a couple of government gigs, right? Yep. Yeah. So the banking, the banking gigs came, came first, went back into banking. And then I, I went into, I mean, after a year or so after Finder, um, I moved into a bank that was heavily functional programming, um, you know, to a heavy functional programming team. And, um, yeah, that was a massive eye opener as well, which we probably also don't have time to dig into. But then obviously we had our, <laughs> After a year of that, I took over the kind of DevOps side of the front office there, and that's where you and I had our second stint working together. Um, oh, and actually, no, we've had three stints working together, haven't we? Because uh, then we did the, uh, the 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 blockchainy stuff after that. Oh God, yeah, yeah, that's uh, <laughs> I... <laughs> we can really get into a rabbit hole with that. Yes, but... we could. Let's not. <laughs> yeah, but but the banking one again, it was like. How can we apply event systems to the world of DevOps um, yep. and continuous integration? Yep. And the architecture and actually, ended up being very similar in a way. It did. It wasn't quite as rigorous, was it? But it was very much a, you know, we have a bunch of stuff that's happening in the real world and we fold over that to, you know, come up with the state of the world. And, you know, it absolutely suits. I mean, obviously, in that, in that context, we also had the parallelization of all the test suite that we had to do as well so that's almost like well yeah i guess it's kind of unfolding i, I guess right so i mean everything in, everything in functional programming is either a fold or an unfold i learned that yeah. from uh, from ollie at finder um and yeah we use both in the in the devops thing yeah you um, either roll up facts or you split the facts into groups and roll those up exactly yep yeah <laughs> uh, map reduce in other parlance mm. 
it's funny how you get all these parallels between like um, think systems that seem disparate. Like you think that um, fold that you think that the world of functional programming is a completely different thing to the world of building event systems, but it's really not. And there's parallels no. in DevOps and the way we do front ends and all that stuff. Yeah, and and you know, obviously, at the time in the bank, uh, another sort of gig that didn't really end particularly well um i'd also been starting to dive into like you know up until i don't know probably 10 years after i left the marines i thought you know it's a cool line item to have on my cv it gets people to attention every now and again and it was a fun thing to do when i was in my 20s but after after you know those those two gigs i really started to dive into you know i'd started to make some early equivalences between how things are done in the military and how things could be done differently in in tech companies and you know for the last i don't know five years i've really really been diving into that and there's there's an awful lot of you know military doctrine and things like that that also look pretty decent with a functional programming slash event sourcing lens applied to them now take me through that because I know by this stage you're a seasoned programmer and you've been doing a lot of project management stuff. Here you are, you've got definitely a functional programming, definitely an event systems mindset. Draw the line from there to military operations. Yeah. Okay, I might have to <laughs> unpack a few things first. Because... Yeah, well, take your time. It's a big it's a big bridge to build. Yeah. So, you know, so the the the, the stereotype of military operations is, you know, what people say is planned with military precision. And, you know, you think that you have this kind of very top down hierarchical, you know, the, the general gives the orders and, and, you know, the people underneath follow the orders and, and things like that. And that's true to a point. But it's also the case that the, the operational side of the military, i.e. when people are going into dangerous places, doing dangerous things is very emergent and very reactive so you know you have this kind of dichotomy of a plan and a purpose and a mission meeting ground reality and having to adapt and that's the thing it's not that we should blindly apply um well you should never blindly apply anything from anywhere but you know that i see a lot of stuff you know books that have been written by you know navy seals or generals or whatever and they're brilliant books and they're the principles are really interesting and and very applicable i feel like what is missing from some of those books is they try to apply them too literally rather than you know extract the principles and let those principles play out in the context of the work that we do Hmm. that sounds like um people getting too obsessed with uh programming patterns I, yeah, programming and social patterns. I mean, you know, when's when's the last time? Well, probably not that recently, but you know, people doing cargo cult agile, or you know, in bigger organisations, having things like safe thrust upon them by a big top-down team of consultants. Yeah, we're going to do and, agile, you know, which means here's the process. Yeah, exactly. Here's <laughs> the process. Um, you know, if if you're not if it's not working, you're not doing it hard enough. Um, Oh, and by the way, now we need to think about OKRs because they also are now this kind of concrete pattern that seems to have emerged. And it just doesn't, I mean, flat out doesn't work, right? The principles are universal, but practice is emergent and context specific. So what are the principles that you think that matter? What are the headline ones? So mm, principles. So this is not really a principle. It's more of a guess I kind of view it as almost kind of axiomatic about you know how the world works but there's a, a a concept called the OODA loop which is basically encapsulates pretty much all of this stuff the OODA loop the OODA loop O-O-D-A stands for observe orient decide act okay now Love this gets a, yeah me too uh, and <laughs> you know when, when you when you just unpack those individual things so observation is is you know events that are coming in orientation is you know what those events mean when they're applied to your current situation decision is folding up a state about it sorry folding up a state exactly. from the stream yep. of events i like yep. it yep. exactly um decision is you know 
what does the mismatch between what we now understand from from doing that versus where we want to be lead us to want to do so that's a decision um and then you know we take an action now that's a really uh, we take an action then actions generate further observations now that is a very very quick run over what people commonly take away from the OODA loop so you see this diagram of you know a, a linear circle of that's uh, sorry a linear process of observe to orient to decide to act and then back to observe hmm. now the, the truth is that you know colonel boyd who who sort of came up with this system he only wrote the the diagram down which is a much more in-depth version of the circle he never wrote the he never drew the circle this was a combination of 40 years of his work from you know fighter aviation in korea through military strategy through studying musashi sun tzu uh, natural sciences heisenberg you know godel's incompleteness theorem right. i mean he he covered a lot so you know re- reading reading up on uda is basically a compression algorithm on all of that stuff that went before right um and it just maps really really well to dealing with uncertainty and being reactive because you know the observation that I've had over the last few years is that you know technologically driven change is accelerating and even things that would have been good practice a few years ago are now slightly behind the times for example if you wanted to build the, the type of thing that we built at finder which we you know, we rented some servers, we, uh, we used Nix and we had some, you know, some DevOps pipelines and some tests and things like that. Hmm. Well, nowadays, you know, for the front end, you'd use something like Vercel if you wanted to get moving really quickly, you'd use cloud, um, you know, cloud resources like Kafka, maybe for the event stream, mm-hmm. you'd certainly use, you know, elastic cloud resources for almost all of the other parts of the stack. Yeah. That's become the default these days, right? Yeah. And maybe you'd use GitHub actions to to do some light testing and you'd be shipping. I mean, we were shipping multiple times a day, you know, on demand, but we weren't properly, properly in production. But the, the affordances that technology offers you for building stuff now means that the practices that you've built up that would have been a good fit five years ago, probably aren't that good a fit now. Right. Yeah. So things like sprints, daily standups, I mean, if you're shipping to customers and getting feedback daily, What's the point in doing it in two week sprints? <laughs> yeah, but but you know we still kind of we we don't think enough from first principles when it comes to structuring teams, and we fall back on practices that we we've seen work in the past. But the problem is when when reality is changing. This is one of the things that the military is also quite good at on a tactical level. Mm. You have to. Ad- adapt your tactics to the ground that you find right you have to adapt your tactics to the to the situation that that uh, that you find yourself in not the other way around right the situation doesn't adapt to your tactics you just don't succeed if you do that yeah so so i see the parallels there to um event streaming right because I'm, I'm always trying to bring this back to event streaming mm-hmm. that's that's the that's the route from which our branches grow here at streaming audio but there's a definite parallel to this way of thinking which is you know events come in you need to deal with them in real time you need to build up a state of the world that, that leads to decisions that go on and react in the world immediately it's no use waiting yeah. overnight or at the end of the month Yep. We're all about de- building reactive real-time systems. And there's also a parallel there to proper agile, like agile with a small a maybe, yeah. where yep. we think about people, not processes, because processes are static, but people are living, breathing human beings we interact with. You yeah, know? absolutely. Um, so I, Boyd, I Boyd that- had a saying, um, people, ideas, technology, in that order, always. And I sometimes feel like, you know, many kind of technical companies get that either the wrong way around or they get the wrong ordering, you know, either either they put the technology first and they force people to jump through the hoops that the technology forces them to do, or they put the idea first and, you know, they get completely fixated on, on an idea and they forget that, you know, it's always people doing the thing, right? Yeah. You know, the other, the other saying Boyd had is that, you know, 
wars are fought by people and they use their minds. You know, they certainly are afforded by technology, but you know, look at look at what's happening in in Ukraine currently for uh, a you know just completely black and white view of reactive, smaller, fast learning force applied to a non you know non learning hierarchical top down much bigger force. Take me through that because I I know nothing of the military strategy on the ground. So how is that playing out? So my my understanding of what's happening in in Ukraine is that so there's a concept from from military doctrine which again is very very prevalent in tech but not really understood you know it's what all of these military books really write about it's the concept of mission command um, and mission command is basically decentralized decision making and you know decentralized empowerment of of people so um, the idea with mission command is that you have a strong kind of alignment with a, a, a mission. But how you achieve that mission is completely the, the person doing the work's remit to to decide within certain constraints. So how that's playing out in in Ukraine is that you've got you know the very very top of of the Russian military is saying I want this to happen, and completely ignoring the fact that the kit doesn't work, the conscripts aren't motivated, they got none of the conditions necessary for for ultimate success other than overwhelming force. And the, the problem there is that because of the, you know, the, the command system that's built up in the Russian military, no, nobody's able to, to tell the, the level above, no, this isn't going to work or no, this isn't going well. Yeah. Um, no feedback loop, no feedback loop, right? No, mm-hmm. no link between bottom up sensing of your environment and, you know, top down, how are we going to achieve what we want to achieve? Whereas the Ukrainians are, you know, they, they've done a lot of work over the last few years to try and re-engineer themselves into a more Western kind of way of fighting wars. There's been lots of NATO um, advisors and things going over there. So what's happening with the Ukrainians is that they have obviously a massively aligned mission. In yep. that, you know, we want our country to still exist and we want our families to be safe. And within that, the units are being given all of these kind of new and shiny weapons and basically figuring out on the fly how to use them. And then they are taking that knowledge of like, you know, this is how you use this new weapon and against, you know, this Russian formation or this Russian tactic. And then that is being spread around. So it's a completely bottom up process and where, where something works, it's transplanted and used somewhere else. So you've got this, you know, I, I, I wrote a post on, on LinkedIn a while ago, likening this to, um, the surface area of of objects floating in a in a fluid, right? If you've got a big block of ice, right, versus the same mass of ice broken up into multiple different little pieces, the the ice that's got the bigger surface area melts quicker or becomes in is in harmony with its environment quicker is another way to look at it. Okay, so the Ukrainians are transmitting what they learn around much faster than the Russians because the Russians clearly aren't learning at all. You know they're getting hammered with the same, the same tactics that um, has been happening all along. So again, back to event sourcing. The, you know, if this was a a, a technical system of some sort, the Ukrainians have a much better event sensing and, you know, a better fold algorithm than the <laughs> Russians do. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. I mean, I. I hesitate to take a, a, such a serious event as that and then talk about our world of programming which is you know a sweet gig let's face it but you yep. can definitely see parallels in the system design yeah where i've worked for companies that operate like a top down no feedback system we're going to do this and two years later they find that the project didn't deliver Yep. I've worked for other companies where people say, here's what we need to get done, but you figure out the best way to do it. And that works. That kind yeah. of trusting people and letting them feedback what's working thing is the essence of Agile, right? Exactly. Exactly. It. Yeah. And, you know, funnily enough, the, the more top down that those businesses are, the longer it takes for them to find out that it's not going to work. So, you <laughs> yeah. know, the more top down it is, the closer to the supposed delivery date you find out that actually it's not going to deliver 
Yeah, yeah. Or usually long after the official delivery date. Yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, and then, you know, you've got all the kind of human biases involved. But, you know, it comes down to not having an effective feedback loop, which, you know, in the context of this conversation means that you don't have an effective event event sensing system. Yeah. Yeah. It's also why I really favor businesses that launch early because yeah. until you've got the customer in that feedback loop, then you haven't really got a feedback, a real feedback loop at all. You're just talking to yourselves internally. Yeah. that, that And that's exactly it. So, I mean, one of the observation, one of the other observations from the, the OODA loop, Boyd was very heavily inspired by the physical sciences, as I said. So if you, if you view, you know, OODA is an out and, and, an outside to inside flow and an inside to outside flow. So observations to orientation is out to in decisions to action is in to out. And, you know, if you don't have effective observations, that's your inward loop broken. If you don't have effective actions, that's your outward loop broken. And if you don't have any contact with the environment, you have a closed system, which inevitably collapses into entropy. Hmm. Um, yeah. I so, am... so what, yeah, go on, sorry. No, yeah, it's it remind it's just reminding me of something I read in a psychology book years ago, which is that people have internal strategies for things, right? They they have strategies for decision making, for example. And you think, okay, well, some people's strategy for decision making is they think of a thing they want and then they think of three different variations, like three things on a menu, and they imagine what it might taste like to eat those things on a menu, and then they pick the thing in their head that tastes nice. And that's what they end up ordering, right? We all have different strategies playing out in our head. And one of the principles in this psychology book was all these different strategies, at some point, they go out into the real world and they test something in the real world. And those generally are much, much healthier strategies than the ones where you spin inside your own head and never get some external component. Yep. And, and it was the theory of this book that most bad psychological patterns have an inner loop that doesn't go for external feedback uh, that's very interesting i'm actually reading um being you at the moment by um anel seth okay which is a an amazing book on the on you know what, what it means to be conscious <laughs> and you know there's there's a um you know the prevailing wisdom probably up until quite recently was that you've got this kind of bottom-up process of you know, sensing different features and then those being glommed up into bigger and bigger things until you get meaning. And actually what the kind of cutting edge cognitive science, which I think applies to organizations as as well, if you if you squint a bit, says that what, what you're actually doing is you're you have this kind of preconceived model of the world, and what you're actually doing is looking for error minimization. So you're you're actually predicting first. Right. And you're your bottom up pro process is actually error minimization. So you're, you're checking for errors in your prediction. So, you know, the, the, in his book, he calls it controlled hallucination. <laughs> so you're, you're imagining, you know, you're, you're operating your internal model is imagining the world and then your senses and, and what you come into contact is telling you what is wrong with your imagination rather than this picture being built from your senses inwards. Okay. That makes uh, we're we're bouncing around topics, but that really makes me think of a principle in uh, music composition, right? Okay. Which is, if I can really summarize it quickly, you want to do you want to establish a pattern and then break it, right? You you play a piece of melody and then you play a slight variation, so people yep. start to build up this prediction of what the third repetition is going to be. Yep. And then you change it just enough that there's a pleasant surprise between the internal, what you thought was about to happen, and what actually happens. Yeah. And we have this thing in our pattern-matching brains, don't we, where we like to establish patterns, but then we get bored of them. Yeah. And it's about introducing just the right amount of novelty to keep things exciting. Yeah. Um, you know, there's, there's loads of um, principles from the physical sciences, like there's, you know, Ashby's law of requisite variety and, and lots of lots of things that say that and, you know, I guess we could go on to Western management principles now, but you yeah. know, Western management principles is all about driving out, um, driving out variation, right? So the whole agile, you know, really started, I mean, 
a big company agile not the kind of you know lean startup that kind of thing but yeah the kind it, of it safe really designed, of the world yeah it, you know, it was really designed to minimize variation but you don't minimize variation in a natural system like mi- minimizing variation means ignoring the outside world because the outside world is always changing yeah because it because a lot of our classic management thinking comes from like henry ford building his car factory right trying yep. to nail things exactly down so it's just a repeatable process yep but that doesn't quite work when that you can make that work when you have a repeatable output of 20,000 identical cars yeah you can't quite make that work in the it doesn't it doesn't serve us in the world we're dealing with today reacting to customers that want different things all the time and different sources of data coming in all the time no, we need, I mean, we need a new way of managing things. Yeah, it works when you're the only car factory in the world. <laughs> it doesn't work when you're competing with someone like Elon Musk building car factories. Yeah. Um, so, and, and, you know, and the world is getting more and more fragmented in that sense because, you know, all of the technology that, I mean, look at, look at Kafka itself, right? That was born out of LinkedIn needing to v- develop a piece of technology people within that business developing that technology and then taking it out and turning it into their own business. And I mean, you, you can, you can't move in the tech scene for, for new technologies that have started in that way. Like I mentioned, you know, Vercel earlier, right? What, what would we have had to do five years ago to get a, you know, SSL protected front end up and running, you know, or, or 10 years ago or 15 yeah. years ago? Now, 15 years ago, you would have had to go and buy a box from somebody, get it shipped to a, a data center, maybe not 15, maybe 20. 20 years ago, I did exactly this. Bought yeah. a box from Dell, had it shipped to a data center, wired it up. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So, you know, and now and now you've got, you literally push to a GitHub repo and you've got a, a live website up and running. Takes seconds. So things that were gating factors before have been mitigated by people inventing technology and that constant process of evolution means that now the bits of technology you use in your day-to-day job are smaller yeah it's the you know back to the kind of unix philosophy smaller and they do one thing well which means that your average business now has that sense making part where they come into the outside world they come into contact with the outside world is now mediated through probably 50 to 100 different pieces of somebody else's technology. So the how you make sense of the world now is completely different to what it was five, 10 years ago. And now you've got this massive data aggregation problem of what actually is all this stuff telling us because it's coming from, you know, all over the place. Yeah, we've got sharper and tighter feedback loops over the years. But, but we've now got the management problem of all this data that we've got coming in in real time, right? Yep, exactly. Um, so do you have any concrete suggestions on how we manage this world of we need to be paying attention to data in real time, but but there's the risk of not doing it. There's also the risk of overwhelm. Yep. Where do we go, Ben? Well, so funny you should mention that. Um, <laughs> my So my exploration of, of military stuff sort of took me into... Yeah, a bit of bit of consulting, a bit of leadership type consulting, and working with other leadership coaches and things like that. And the thing that's become really apparent over the last couple of years is that you have to have some capacity in the system for any of that stuff to land, right? All of the stuff about you know building better OODA loops and having time to think. Well, if everyone's completely maxed out, you know, if all your cores are running at one hundred percent, you don't have space for another job. Mm. Um, yeah. And so over the last couple of years, I've actually taken some open source technologies and used them to build internal systems with a view of giving people back that capacity first, because with all of these, you know, operational, let's call it operational fragmentation, you've got, you know, a bit here for doing a very specific job, a bit over here, they'll be spread over different departments in the company like marketing and ops and customer success. And, you know, your, your aggregate picture of the world is a, as a business owner is now fragmented across all these different systems, very much like that picture of cognition from, from being here, right? You've got your, 
your predictions of the world are now meeting fragmented data coming in. And in most businesses, that defragmentation process is done by, you know, either either it's the middle managers who are, you know, spending inordinate amounts of time preparing reports by pulling yeah. data from all these different systems. Yeah. So you've got your most expensive people that should be, you know, leading and doing the human side of sense making, you know, stuck in Excel for <laughs> yeah, compiling a, spreadsheets. A, yeah, a, you know, yeah. a large portion of their day. Or you've got those sort of more back office systems being built by actually probably fairly junior admin type folks. So you've got people doing the job of machines, right? We we both know we've just spent you know, 40 minutes talking about how algorithms are how ag- algorithms that do this stuff have been developed. So the, the approach that I've taken over the last couple of years of consulting is, well, let's just take a bunch of that awesome technology that's been made available to us, turn it into a stack for building internal systems, you know, build lightweight infrastructure to aggregate all the data from all those different systems into your model of the world, and then put BI systems over the top from that single consolidated source of truth. And it's a, you know, dead simple approach. But, you know, the the application of five or six different open source technologies to build that internal system, which is has to be unique for every business because it's, you know, the com- combinatorial nature of all these different operational systems means that whatever sits in the middle is going to be pretty much unique. Probably some patterns and some similarities, but you know, that thing is your, your orientation from the OODA loop. Your orientation is the thing that sits in the middle and lets you make decisions. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think so- there's a big question of how we can get a kind of reusable structure that does that bespoke reaction that we need. Yeah. And you know, the conclusion that I've come to is that you, you can't have that as a product, right? You can have a bunch of products that you join together, but the actual, you know, the, the wiring of the neurons of that thing is specific to every business, which is why I'm not, you know, I'm not building a product for this. I'm building a service for this where the, the product kind of emerges over time internally in response to the needs of the business. And what, you know, one of the biggest needs is don't run any of your operations on Excel for God's sake. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Excel's good for prototyping, I think, because it's fast. But even even then, I think um, I, I I would have agreed with you maybe six months ago. But I've come across a product called Causal these days. Causal, you're going to have to yeah. give us a list of links for the show notes. Because yeah, absolutely, yeah. Um, so Causal Causal dot app. Um, it's a spreadsheet replacement online, but it's you you build a pretty much like you remember you remember the. The system that we used to have in the bank, which was the the DAG, the 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 trading the trading strategies would be arranged in a DAG. What's well, very much like an Excel DAG in a in a spreadsheet. So they have something similar with a little lightweight programming language. But the difference is that in each of the cells, you can put a probability distribution. So then, for building your model, you end up with you end up with a probabilistic model. And they run Monte Carlo, Monte Carlo simulation for you. So you build your you build your model kind of bottom up from the unit economics of your business, right? And then you play forward. What does that look like played out over time? And then you tweak variables, and it reruns a simulation for you. Well, so you're, cool. you're putting in a probability of someone purchasing a particular item, and that eventually leads to what your month sales figures. Is that the kind of system you're talking about? Yeah. So you could you could do. Um, you know, I'm going to charge between X and Y for this product. Yeah. See what that does. Okay. If I charge, you know, if I charge X and it doesn't work and, not, and it's not profitable, much better to have done that in some sort of simulation of the world rather than actually play it out in real time and find out that you weren't profitable six months after you needed to know it. <laughs> okay. That's a curious system. It's really cool. That. Really, really cool. Um, and it, And it also, you know, because it's a modern piece of software, it integrates well with, lots of different source data so you can actually you can actually feed in your real results to it as well so you build a model you feed the model with real data and then you watch your predicted versus actuals play out and it's always up to date so you've got that kind of that part of the that predictive part of 
a business about you know what the business model looks like and you know whether we've got cash in the bank in six months is kind of updated in real time versus again somebody having to spend time you know cutting and pasting new csvs into an excel spreadsheet and making sure you haven't like overwritten a formula and stuff oh, interesting okay well that makes me think maybe we should uh, begin to wrap this up with because i know you're always researching and watching the skies Give me a, a technology or a book recommendation I should look into beyond being you and causal. Okay. Um, so Boyd, the fighter pilot that changed the, the face of war is a, a biography of Boyd and his work and it is much more in depth than trying to kind of unpars a load of stuff from a diagram that he wrote towards the end of his life. Well, that's how we can um, break down the UDA loop, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's a much more of a kind of base understanding of, what his motivations were. Um, another book that I've really, really enjoyed and has shaped a lot of my thinking is um, The Origin of Wealth by Eric Beinhocker, which okay. looks at, it looks at, you know, the, about? it looks at modern economics and this kind of system that we all work within from, through the lens of evolution and natural selection. Okay. And it's, I mean, when you, when you, think about all of the evolution of technology that we've just been talking about it's a book about the underlying mechanics of how that works okay uh i shall get onto amazon yeah <laughs> uh, sorry I'm, i always do this i'm a denial of service attack on people's book lists all the time <laughs> you are every time i talk to you my my reading <laughs> list grows <laughs> yeah ben, ben it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you yes you too chris it's uh always always a pleasure yeah, I'll catch you again soon. Thanks for being on the Indeed. show. All right. Cheers, Chris. Cheers. Bye. Bye. That was Ben Ford. And I've got to tell you, he's exactly like that in real life. Every time I talk to him, I go away with a new list of links I need to check out and a handful of books I need to append to my stack. Um, I've got homework. We'll put links to all of that in the show notes if you want to follow up with any of it. Among the show notes, you'll also find a link to Confluent Developer, which is our site that teaches you everything we know about Kafka. So if you need a backbone for your real-time data systems, that's the great place to get started. We've got everything from getting started guides to full system walkthroughs to videos about how people are using Kafka in the real world. So check it out at developer.confluent.io. And if you need to get Kafka running quickly or keep it running easily, then head to confluent.cloud, which is our fully managed Apache Kafka service. You can get started in minutes. There's no credit card required. But if you add the promo code PODCAST100 on the billing page, you'll get $100 of extra free credit to run with. And with that, it just remains for me to thank Ben Ford for joining us and you for listening. I've been your host, Chris Jenkins, and I will catch you next time. <laughs>